I don't get why like people act as if Jackie Kennedy was like the paragon of American beauty. Like even as far as white women go, the woman was mid. Okay, she looks like a fucking hammerhead shark. That just shows that like money and access to power like warps people's notion of what is attractive. Like I'm a gay man, maybe I shouldn't be commenting on the attractiveness of of, of non male people, but she she looks like a fucking hammerhead shark. Okay, like it's, that's just objective fact. Was assassinated gives the world an entirely new perspective on the former first lady. In these interviews, she speaks candidly about her husband, the president, and his private thoughts on some of the powerful historical figures of the time. It was only months after her husband's assassination when a 34-year-old widow... I think Jackie did it, honestly. I think Jackie killed her husband. ...sat down to record more than eight hours of recollections about her husband and his most private thoughts while they were still fresh, even raw. JFK and his brother Bobby on Lyndon Johnson, the new president. Bobby told me this later, and I know Jack said it to me sometimes. He said, oh God, can you ever imagine what would happen to the country if Lyndon was president? So many times he'd say it if there was ever a problem. On the day her husband was buried, the former first lady had written to thank LBJ for all his kindness, calling him, quote, Jack's right arm. And so... So in public letters to the guy, like, well, private letters to the guy, you're lauding him to the fucking, to, to fucking Mars. But like in private, you're talking about like what a disaster he would be. Like, this just shows how like duplicitous and two-sided these people are. Don't trust anything a politician says. Well, does Jackie Kennedy qualify as a politician? I mean, she was certainly a public figure, but man, why the fuck am I talking about this white woman on the death anniversary of MLK? Because she had some thoughts on MLK. More than that, we were friends, all four of us. Oh. Yeah, JFK was definitely the most gay-coded modern American president. Almost a half century later, we hear a different view, perhaps colored by Bobby Kennedy's resentments after the assassination and her annoyance after this call from Johnson a month after her husband's death, two days before Christmas. I hope that you are doing all right. LBJ was definitely the most black-coded modern American president. Like, this guy literally threatened to send his Air Force One cooks to Vietnam because they served him and his staff, like, rare meat. I was like, God damn it, you're serving rare, rare meat. I don't know how you do it wherever the fuck you're from, but if you serve raw meat on my plane again, your ass is going to be Vietnam. Yep, I will have your ass at K-Sol lot in eight hours. It ain't a joke. Don't fucking play with me, buddy. I have the biggest dick in America. I have the biggest dick in America. My britches have to be specially made to hold my giant ding dong. Don't fuck with me, buddy. Don't serve no goddamn raw meat on my airplane no more. Otherwise, your ass is going to be crawling through the jungle fighting Ho Chi Minh, personally. Oh, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Do you know how much we love you? You have a good Christmas there. Thank you. The same to you. Tonight. Hours later, Jackie learned LBJ was in fact showing off for a room full of reporters. Now is the time. Just as stunning are criticisms of the leader of the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King. Okay, there were several leaders of the civil rights movement. He was a leader of one wing of the civil rights movement. He was definitely like, when he showed up, people showed up. He had that charisma. He had that voice. He had that pull. But like calling MLK the leader of the civil rights movement, it kind of washes out a lot of the work that was done in major part by women. Yeah, major part by women. Daisy Bates, uh, Ella Baker, um, Rosa Parks. Like, Rosa Parks was just a tired old seamstress who refused to get up and give a white man her seat, okay? Find somebody who loves you the way LBJ loved his own hog. Yeah, he even gave the fucker a nickname. He even gave the fucker a nickname. And apparently, according to everybody that ever saw his dick, which is like quite a few people, he was a big fan of showing it off to reporters. See, see, here's another tangent. This is why I ignore Chad. Now we're talking about LBJ's dick and not one of the greatest black people who ever graced the face of this abysmal country. But, um, yeah, like calling MLK the leader 
of the civil rights movement. It's it's a willful bourgeois obfuscation tactic. Like, yes, he was an extremely important individual, and his politics did develop in major part because of uh, his, I hate calling it a rivalry, but his uh, supposed rivalry with Malcolm X. Like, they actually played off each other. Like, by saying that Malcolm became soft because of MLK, no. But after leaving the Nation of Islam cult, he actually leaned more towards MLK's um MLK's position position and he was more open to working with uh working with uh radical white people. Like he was a well the Socialist Workers Party was a big fan of him. And they, they published they published a few of his speeches and Malcolm said, like when he was in the Nation of Islam, he was saying that oh no white people are good. But then after he left, he was saying that the only good white people are the socialists. So there you go. Of course, I think his opinion might have changed if he had had the opportunity to hang out with some more white socialists and he would have found out how ain't shit those people are. But yeah, and MLK actually gravitated towards a more radical position towards the end of his lifetime. As a matter of fact, his opposition to the imperialist war in Vietnam was a major factor why the FBI tried to get him to uh, to unalive himself. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but yes, I definitely think the federal government had something to do with this man's death. King Jr. But they need to be understood in context. At the time, FBI Director J. What fucking context? These people are a bunch of fucking racists. LBJ, Jackie Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, RFK. Like, these people didn't give a shit about black people. JFK literally said, I want that fucking civil rights mess kept off my friggin' desk. Like, that was his position on the civil rights movement. Why did LBJ and JFK st suddenly start acting like they gave a shit about black people? It wasn't because they had had some change of heart. It was because they realized that black people are an important uh, source of votes. Yeah, votes. That's really all that politicians care about. That's why when I say that we have to conquer power, I'm, little, I'm not saying that you should literally take your old ass Mosin and go try to take over City Hall. That would be a way to die a very brave but very stupid death. I'm saying that we have to be politically astute and we have to be politically wise and we have to not let these people make asses out of us uh, and play off our emotions. Like we have to be cynical and hard nosed just the way they are if we want political gains out of this system. Ultimately, the system is not going to. Uh, ultimately, the system is not going to liberate us. Like I've said this a million times, I remain a Marxist-Leninist Maoist, but I'm not a stupid Marxist-Leninist Maoist. Like throughout my, I was about to say political career, throughout my like time doing this and talking about politics and revolutionary radical politics, like I think I've made a name for myself as a pragmatist. Basically, like we're not going to liberate ourselves with stupid shit and we don't need we don't need dead revolutionaries. We need living revolutionaries. We need living revolutionaries who are able to learn from our mistakes. We couldn't. We can't keep making fatal mistakes. We can't keep ending up getting shot up in our houses or murdered in the streets. We have to do better. So, yeah, as long as the vast majority of the American people see elections as legitimate, I'm not talking about those Trump people who stupidly stormed the Capitol on January 6th. I'm talking about like as as long as the average workaday American sees the ballot box as a valid arena of political struggle, we're gonna have to engage with it, like it or not. To do otherwise would be ultra left adventurism, and I'm pretty sure we've all had enough of that. Edgar Hoover was trying to incite. Is this about the video on MLK that Hassan said was terrible? I haven't seen the video on MLK that Hassan said was terrible. Well, why do I need a white guy's opinion on something about MLK? Divisions between the Kennedys and Dr. King by telling Bobby Kennedy that Dr. King was overheard on FBI wiretaps making crude comments about Jackie Kennedy kissing her husband's coffin on the day of Jack's funeral. The tapes were supposed to be locked in a vault for a century, but Caroline Kennedy decided to release them now, all eight and a half hours, uncensored, because she felt you don't change someone else's oral history. She also explained it isn't surprising her mother would have, at the time, made some statements she might have changed later. As Caroline told Parade, when she first read the transcript shortly after her mother died, they reminded her that her mother felt what made historical figures human was what made them more interesting. And indeed, emerging from this oral history is a very different Jacqueline Kennedy. Not the long familiar public no, figure no, no. whose whispery voice guided us running. through the White House. It just seemed to me such a shame when we came. What the hell is ultra leftism? 
Oh, buckle in, buddies. Ultra leftism is basically getting ahead of the people. That's the best way that we can describe it. I actually think that's how Mao described it. It's basically like thinking that you have all the answers and all the people need to do is follow you. And right opportunism would be saying that whatever the people already believe is what we should do. So an example, say you are organizing a, you're organizing a union at a Volkswagen plant in Alabama or Tennessee. So you have some racist white workers. Ultra leftism would be saying that, oh, we shouldn't work with these people. These are racist. These are Nazis. These are horrible people. We need to go to the factory and beat them up. That would be ultra leftism because even though they have certain backwards ideas, say they're xenophobes, they don't think that Mexican workers should be allowed to work at the plant, what have you. You have to struggle that stuff away from them as a communist. And ultra rightism would be making allowances for their racism and allowing them to be racist or even worse, inco incorporating their racism into your party's line. That would be right opportunism, basically trying to get easy gains by, um, by catering to reactionaries. So both are fucked up and both will lead to the failure to develop a union. Because when you're an ultra leftist, when you basically try to cut these people out, you allow the reactionary minded backwards thinking white workers to uh, fall into the arms of the Klan and all sorts of other nasty people. And when you're an ultra rightist, you alienate black workers who may or may not be the majority of the plant. So the proper way is to struggle against ideologically, of course, I'm not saying use fists, although that may be justified in the case of especially backwards leadership, but, um, you have to work with people and you have to bring people up to the level of proletarian revolutionaries. You never sink to their level and you never jump out ahead of them. Hopefully that is an adequate explanation of the dangers and pitfalls of ultra leftism and ultra rightism. I'm here to find hardly anything of the past in the house. Or the fashion icon whom the president joked he accompanied to Paris. I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy uh, to Paris. And I've enjoyed And my head just did that. I wasn't shot. I had just did that. I, I was, it was a very stressful day. Jack, it was getting on my nerves and my head just exploded. That's why, that's why like, maybe I, if I had called Dr. Fucking Jacobson, he would have gave me an injection. You know, this guy was literally strung out on meth, like during his entire presidency. Like he had this doctor, Max Jacobson, they called him Dr. Feelgood. Like he even had Kennedy even had this, this fucking quack doctor, uh, accompany him to Vienna. He met with Khrushchev like high off his balls. And this guy would literally take a bunch of uh, a bunch of substances, amphetamines, um, vitamins, pig placenta, all sorts of fucked up shit and mix it together. Like he dosed so many politicians and celebrities and whatnot. And uh, JFK was a big fan. Like to get him off of these like killer doses of amphetamines that this doctor had him on. Uh, his regular doctors, his white house doctors literally had to, um, like had to be like, Hey Jack, like if you keep taking this stuff, okay, you've got your finger on the button that can blow us all the fuck up. So we really think that you don't need to be, uh, like taking this shit every day. Like, we're not going to die because you have fucking, because you're coming down off speed, okay? So we can either go to the press and they can basically drag you for a dope fiend or you can do other things other than take a shitload of meth every day. And he's like, oh, well, I'll, okay, that's good. Yeah, I don't want to be a drug addict. Drugs are for blacks. So, yeah. This Jacqueline Kennedy is far more complex with a keen eye for the characters around her husband. And she was also a racist prick. This video was will an Iran Israel war break out? Hmm. So Israel did blow up the fucking did blow up did fucking like blow up shit in Damascus that pertains to Iran, no? I mean, that's a pretty ample justification for war. It's brought to you. Adolf Hitler did anything that could be injected or snorted or smoked. By ground news. On Monday, Iran accused Israel of carrying out an airstrike against a consular building inside the Iranian embassy compound in Damascus, Syria. The Isn't this wild? Like, Israel gets away with so much shit. Like, how can you just blow up another, another country's fucking consulate in a foreign country? Like, Syria is not Israel. 
So how the fuck are you going to send shit from here to here and attack here? How, how can you do that? How can you do that? Like if this shit was take going was going out in Africa, there would already be UN peacekeepers on the fucking ground. The strike killed seven Iranian military advisors. In yeah, Israel loves killing other countries' uh, citizens. Like that whole shit with the um with the relief agency. Like it's sad that it took like the deaths of white people from Poland, Australia, and the UK for this to like for this to piss people off. Same thing, like it took Aaron Bushnell burning himself alive, a white soldier burning himself alive to get like a lot of white people in middle America to be like, you know what? Yeah, this is, this is fucked up. Like why are these people allowed to get away with this? What is with the big smoke fit? I dress like this every day. Leave me the fuck alone. Would you, what would you, what would you like me to wear? What would you like me to wear? Hmm? Chat, what would you like me to wear? What would you like me to wear to stream? Pick my clothes for me. Including Mohammed. Yeah, like this is fucked up. And people have been saying on Twitter, like, it's, it's sad that it takes white people's deaths to make people move their asses. Like, a couple days after, fucking Biden is on the phone with Netanyahu, basically grilling him. And then, oh, whoop the fucking do. Now we're opening up an AIDS corridor. Now we're opening up an aid corridor. Like, wh where were you? Why didn't you pick up the phone? Like, you have enough, you have time enough to castigate Palestinian activists and lie. Why couldn't you pick up the phone and call Netanyahu? Like, Reagan literally did this when one of Netanyahu's predecessors was fucking Beirut up the ass. Like, literally massacring civilians. Reagan literally, like, do you have any idea how fucked up what you're doing has to be to piss off Ronald fucking Reagan? And he called and he was like, hey. Uh, what you're doing, I'm looking at it, and it's really bad. I don't, I don't know what you're doing, but like, can you stop killing innocent civilians? Uh, otherwise, there's gonna be issues. And the Israelis stopped. Biden had this power. He just refused to. He just refused to exercise it. Why? Because he doesn't give a fuck. Razor Zahani, a top commander of Iran's elite Quds Force. And his death has been described by some as the most high profile targeted killing of an Iranian since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani by the US in 2020. The attack has also been seen as a serious. Why did Reagan care about what Israel was doing? Because Reagan was a better politician than Biden. Like, people don't like allies of our country massacring innocent fucking civilians on their news feed. Well, we didn't have news feeds back then, I guess, on their television screen. And nobody wants to see Dan Rather, like, in Beirut, being like, hey, we're funding these guys, and this is what they're doing. Of course, the average American may or may not give a shit, but, like, it makes us look bad on the international scale. And, like, Reagan was actually president when the time when that mattered. Now, of course, I don't know what the... What the like, nowadays, I guess the ruling class in this country is just like, you know what? Fuck it. We ball. But like to, to man. escalation. This is why we need a revolution. Like you, you all keep asking me like, what is the solution to this? What is the solution to that? What is the solution to this? What is the solution to revolution? R E V O L U T I O N. In the wider Iran Israel struggle and Iran has vowed to retaliate. So in this video, we're going to explain what happened. Why Israel can't explain what happened. Why, why, well, why, why did Israel attack, attack Syria? Why did you attack the Iranian consulate, but That's not good, blood. Right. And how Iran might respond. You know, the Iranian mullahs were actually like, people act like these people have been our enemies forever, but like, um, during the Cold War, like communism was the big bad. So the United States actually funded and supported fundamentalist Islamists like the uh, like the Iranian mullahs, like the Muslim Brotherhood, all of these different groups that would end up turning into even nastier groups. And then they turn around and bit us in the ass. Like the same people that took our diplomats hostage in Iran in 19, uh, in, in, uh, 79, 80, 79, in that time period, uh, the same people who did that, the guys who ran them were also the same people that they, that they tried to use to overthrow, uh, Mossadegh in 53. So yeah, America has a habit and also the Brits have a habit of backing these fucked up people to forestall the communist threat. And then 30, 40 years later, they turn around and fuck us in the ass 
And that's all 9-11 was. Like the people that did 9-11, Al-Qaeda, were the same people that we were funding in the 80s to fuck the Soviets up in Afghanistan. We wanted to give the Soviets a Vietnam. Of course, yes, the Soviets invading Afghanistan was a stupid fucking idea. Invading Afghanistan in general is a stupid fucking idea. Like, you're not going to conquer these people. All they're going to do is go back to their little mountains and go back to their little caves. And they're going to hide out and they're going to fuck you up. They're going to wait. Like, these are masters of guerrilla warfare, okay? Like, that's what the Pashtun are known for. So you're not going to defeat these people. You're not going to fight these people. Like, how much ordnance? How many soldiers? How many rounds of ammunition have we dumped in Afghanistan? And what happened? We ended up leaving like fucking, like it was fucking Saigon. If I recall correctly, the same helicopter that ferried the troops, well, the last U.S. troops and diplomatic corps in uh, South Vietnam, that same helicopter ferried everybody out of Kabul. Yeah, history in this case repeated itself atrociously, but we should have never went over there in the fucking first place. We never should have. Like, it was just asking for an ass whooping, but America seems addicted to ass whoopings. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and mates. Until the Islamic Revolution in 1979, Iran and Israel were sort of strategic allies with a set of shared geopolitical interests. In the 60s, they were both worried about the Soviet Union's growing influence in the Middle East and the emergence of an Arab nationalism fronted by Egypt's President Abdel Nasser. And good relations with Iran were especially important for Israel, because Iran was Israel's largest supplier of oil at the time. But it all goes back to oil. While official relations were suspended after the 1979 Islamic Revolution, the Israel-Iran relationship didn't properly die until the 1990s. And yeah, like the Israelis were still selling, selling and trading um, weapons to the Iranians like all throughout the 80s. That's for two reasons. Firstly, there was a continued strategic rationale behind it, especially once Iraq invaded Iran in the early 80s. At the time, Saddam Hussein's Iraq was probably Israel's main regional rival, so Israel secretly supported Iran in an attempt to undermine Iraq. Secondly, the Israelis were always optimistic that the Ayatollah's regime would collapse. As late as 1987, the then defense minister and future prime minister Yitzhak Rabin said that Iran is they killed him. Israel's best friend, and we do not intend to change our position in relation to Tehran because Khomeini's regime will not last forever. Well, However, once it became clear that the Ayatollahs were here to stay and Iran emerged out of the Iran-Iraq conflict stronger than ever, Iran and Israel quickly became geopolitical nemeses, and that's how things have been ever since. So let's return back to the current day. Israel's authorities generally tend not to publicly discuss Israel's actions in Syria, and of course not, because they're illegal. In response to a question about Monday's air... I don't know. The Israelis are some, like... They're, they're, uh, they are some don't-give-a-fuck motherfuckers. They're not going to be like, yeah, we did this. Yeah, we did it. What, what the fuck are you going to do about it? Like, what are you going to do? Cut off our weapons? Are you going to bomb Tel Aviv? Honestly, it would be pretty dope if we did, but... Yeah, you all are going to do shit. Like, they need, a, they need a hard fucking spanking. And by hard fucking spanking, I mean their country no longer exists strike an israeli military spokesperson said we do not comment on reports in the foreign media however really <laughs> the new york times cites four anonymous israeli officials who confirmed that israel was behind the attack additionally a spokesperson did tell cnn that israel believes the target was a quote a military building of the quds forces disguised as a civilian building in damascus adding that according to our intelligence this is no consulate, and this is no embassy. Really, what is it? And what is Assad going to do? Like, your country was just fucking bombed by Israel, bruh. Like, you talk all this hard-ass shit. Like, you're the fucking lion. You're the lion of Damascus. Are you just going to let them fuck you over like this? Following the airstrike, Syria's foreign and interior ministers visited the site, saying we strongly condemn this atrocious terrorist attack that targeted the Iranian consulate building in Damascus and killed a number of innocents. On top of this, Iran's foreign minister called it a violation of all international obligations and conventions, while a foreign ministry spokesperson said Iran preserves the right to take reciprocal measures and will decide the type of response and punishment against the aggressor. 
Now, before we get into how Iran might respond to the attack, we're going to explain some of the reasons why Israel may have decided to strike this particular target. Because they know they can get away with it. Because it's worth pointing out that Israeli strikes against Iranian and Iran-linked military installations in Syria are nothing new. These were taking place way before October 7th and have increased since then. But this latest strike is the first time that Israel has actually hit Iran's embassy compound. Now, the first and most obvious reason for Israel carrying out this strike is that they wanted to eliminate the military commanders in order to do damage to the operational ability of Iran, Israel's main adversary and its regional allies. In fact, since October 7th, Israel has carried out a number of high-profile targeted killings outside of Israel and the Palestinian territories. So they can just, because they, because they're the like supposed to be the underdog, they aren't, but that's how America tend to view them. They can just go around murking people. Like, <laughs> they need a fucking spanking. Like, that's why... Since October 7th, I keep saying that October 7th was fucking glorious because this country needed to be humbled. Ideally, it wouldn't exist anymore, but in the meantime, it just needs to be humbled and humbled and humbled and humbled until it doesn't exist anymore. Like, it just needs to keep getting taking L's and L's and L's and L's and L's until it collapses. And this, is, this, this country is defined by hubris. That's what it's defined by. Like, these people actually think that they can do whatever the fuck they want without any consequences. October 7th and the dozens of other glorious days in the history of the occupied Palestinian people have shown that to be false. Like, Israel will fall because of this hubris. Like, you cannot just murder, you cannot just fucking murder people from other countries, citizens of other countries. You cannot just bomb other people's embassies. Like that's a violation of international law. Like every international law that exists, Israel has broken it and then lies about breaking it and then enlists America's stupid ass to run interference for it, making a substantial chunk of an important part of the world hate us. Like Israel is literally more trouble than it's worth. We need to cut them loose. But beyond this reason, the airstrike could also be seen as an attempt by Israel to test the resolve of Iran and its allies. So far, test the resolve of our rant. Like, like y'all still are not getting it. Why are you testing people's resolve? Like you tested the resolve of the Palestinian people and now they're kicking your ass. Now you're going to try to invade Lebanon. You're going to try to invade Rafa and fuck, the, fuck with the Egyptians now. So you're going to end up getting your ass kicked in by three fucking countries and it's going to be all your fault. Because America is not going to back you forever, bro. Iran has not directly intervened in the wider conflict, and exchanges between Israel and Iranian allies have remained relatively contained to tit-for-tat exchanges. By watching Iran's response to this latest strike, though, Israel can better gauge the extent to which Iran is willing or unwilling to involve itself. But as a more cynical explanation, it could also be seen as an attempt to uphold the Israel versus Iran nature of the conflict in order to keep the United States from rolling back its support of Israel. Perhaps more important though, are the domestic issues at play in Israel. We've talked about this in other videos, but Benjamin Netanyahu's approval among the Israeli public basically collapsed after October 7th, and it's highly likely that he'll be voted out of office come the next election. In fact, on Sunday, the day before the strike, they even hold a fucking election. Strike in Damascus. I, I love how people are like playing up these protests. Like, why are you marching under an Israeli flag? Like, revolutionaries in the United States don't march under our flag. Of course, I'm not implying that these people are revolutionaries, but like, if people are constantly looking for progressive people in Israel or revolutionaries in Israel. And actually, they found some. Yeah, they found some. Somebody actually tried to try to uh, go ham on motherfuckers. I shaved my beard. I may regret it. I may not. I think I. I don't think I will. But they actually found the Israeli left. They're actually willing to throw down. Well, some of them are. Where are you? This is what I want to see from like the Song of Ice and Fire universe. Like I'm sick of Westeros. Westeros is a backward shithole. Like, I want to see fucking E.T. The God Emperor Lobu mustered 300,000 men and launched an extermination campaign of the Jaws and I, who defeated him in 13 separate battles and drank from his skull dipped in gold. 
That's what I want to see. Fuck the Blackfire Rebellion and all that other stupid shit. The Blackfire Rebellion was still cool, even though it was a stupid cause. But yeah, I want to see other parts of the world. I want to see Sotharios, where my people are from. Speaking of my people, this is the neighborhood that my uh, my family comes from, Mark Twain. It's St. Louis. Beautiful houses. Seven Israelis and poor four Palestinians were arrested on suspicion of planning to commit terror attacks in Israel and trying to assassinate National Security Minister Itamar ben Gavir, authorities said Thursday. I'm not subscribing to you, and I'm certainly not sending you people money. My, how the tables turn. Security officials said the defendants were charged with planning attacks on various targets, including military bases, Ben Gurion International Airport, and the government complex in Jerusalem. They also planned to kidnap soldiers and assassinate Ben Gavir by firing an RPG at him. Jesus, they hated that dude. I mean, anybody with common sense hates that dude, but yeah. There we go. Let's see if I can bust this paywall real quick. Because I am not sending money to Haaretz. It's fine. Let's see if I can get it from another website. Israel arrests. <laughs> They're trying to blame it on ISIS terrorists. Ten Palestinian Authority Arabs were arrested. Because they were supposed illegal immigrants. Jesus, why do all Israeli websites look like shit? But yeah, some fucking heroes were apparently trying to take that dude out. So, all power to them. By what standard of morality can the violence used by a slave to break his chains be considered the same as the violence of a slave master? By no standard of morality. <laughs> this, is a, this is a mock up of the. Discussion between Netanyahu and Biden. Netanyahu, you want me to thank you? Biden. Well, golly, I mean, look what I did. I ignored Congress so I could keep sending you weapons. I didn't, look, I didn't let them check if you were following the laws of war. I told America that Palestinians might be faking their debts. I didn't even know if that was true. Same with those beheaded, you know, the things. We vetoed every goddamn UN resolution that came along. We bombed the crap out of the Houthis. We backed you up when you attacked all the hospitals. I don't know why you did that, but I didn't ask. Hell, we basically threw Nelson Mandela under the bus. Well, America's always thrown Nelson Mandela under the bus. They literally had him on a terrorist watch list until like the 2000s. Under the bus when South Africa took you to court, I'd say I did an awful lot for you. And it didn't make me popular, let me tell you. Kids called me Genocide Joe to my face in an election year. And frankly, you didn't give me much in return. We asked you over and over to tone it down, to reduce those civilian casualties, or to come up with a plan for an endgame and not to mire us in a regional war. Heck, you didn't do any of it, no matter how many times we ask. Surely you'd like to say a few words to me after all that, Netanyahu says. Fuck you. Biden, excuse me? Netanyahu, shall I spell it? Biden, I don't, I don't understand. Netanyahu, I'll phrase it differently. Go to hell. Get bent. Eat shit. Biden, hey buddy, watch your mouth. I'm the president of the United States, Netanyahu. You're nothing. You're a pathetic old man. You got played, chomp. Funny story, BRG, but I got into a debate, oh boy, about Uganda's anti-LGBT laws and how European colonialism spread homophobia to the world. And this one guy called me a rainbow demon and said he wished he knew where I lived so he could decapitate me. This is some Balkan shit. This is why you don't get into arguments with people on the internet. So this is the Freedom Flotilla Coalition. Dylan Saba says that they will be joining the Freedom Flotilla Coalition, which in mid-April will be bringing 5,500 tons of humanitarian aid and hundreds of international human rights observers to challenge the Ill illegal Israeli blockade of Gaza. Based. 
it's based. Like, it's good that people are, um, are putting their lives on the line to like actually be like, hey, you know what? We're done talking about this. We're actually going to do something about it. So how to help? You can keep up to date. Follow them on the web. They're on Facebook and Twitter or Instagram and share the brochure. Build solidarity by endorsing the campaign and helping organizing events to raise funds and awareness for our campaign or join one of the work teams. You can spread the word. You can help the Freedom Flotilla sale. You can make a donation to one of the organizations that are participating in this. So there's quite a few of them. And I'm going to link because I want you all to donate money to this. So yeah, help Gaza get some aid. They need it. And most importantly, they need the land back. This is what they thought of Martin Luther King when he was alive. So here's Martin Luther King. He's roaring drunk and his kids are down here. Civil rights movement. The liquor bottles say anti-Vietnam, 100 proof. Father, father, dear father, come home with me now. I plan to lead another nonviolent march tomorrow. I saw a poll a couple weeks ago basically saying that like the majority of white Americans opposed um, what MLK was doing. So, yeah, honestly, in America, if white people don't oppose what you're doing, then you're probably not doing the right thing. These are people who are doing the right thing. So this is at uh, Lockheed Martin, and it's in Sullivan, California, and these protesters are basically like blocking off the entrance to this facility and this paragon of the white working class. Well, see what he does next. Was MLK a bad father? No, by all accounts, he was actually a very good father. Go to prison. Get out of the way. You want to go to prison? Somebody's gonna die. You. So this guy gets out of his car and he immediately pulls out a knife. I'm telling you right now. Like no discussion, no nothing. This guy pulls out a knife and immediately starts trying to cut people. Somebody's going to die. Get out of my way. If that isn't the fucking settler anthem. And like people are arguing in the comments. Oh, he's not a working class person. He's an engineer. It doesn't matter. Okay. Like settler colonialism and mass violence. It doesn't necessarily have a class stamp on it. That's the thing with settler colonial countries. The oppression is cross class. The oppression is cross-class. So if you're white in America, like, you don't have to be a fucking millionaire to hate black people. As a matter of fact, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to hate black people. History has shown. So this is a cross-class collaboration between people who make $20,000 a year or $200,000 a year. Like, hating Palestinians isn't just something that's bound up to how much money you make. <laughs> Settlers are fucked in the head. Get out! Bro, you're on video. You're on video. You're on video, you're on video. You're on video right now. If you want to go to prison, I don't think about it. If you want to go to prison, you fucking your... get out of the way. I you gotta get to my job. You think about your future. You are felony. Think about your future. I gotta get to my job. You get out of the fucking way. Think about your future, bro. Hey, careful. Why are you gonna hurt people today? Why are you gonna hurt people? Don't you dare. Why are you gonna hurt people? Be ready. Be ready. Why are you gonna hurt people? He even has a Hitler mustache. We have eyes on you, sir! We have eyes on you, sir! Don't you need some fucking guns on him. That's why I hate this, like, peaceful protest shit. Like, how the fuck are you gonna confront a man with a knife? You've got your head all in this fucking car. Like, am I saying this should have been a shootout? No. But, come on. Like, these people are violent. You cannot confront violent people with a fucking reflective vest and... Calm words. These people are murderous. They are. They, they see the pictures, okay? They see the same pictures. They see the same videos that we're looking at. They do not care. Do this. We have eyes on you. We have eyes on you. We have eyes on you. And why? Why do you continue? Why do you continue to try to block the dude's car? This dude is gonna run you the fuck over. Like, no, come on. Elon Musk announces that Twitter and X is going to undergo a purge to eliminate bots and trolls. Cool. So does that mean that every time one of my posts goes viral, that I don't have a million racists calling me Tyrone in my replies? I doubt it. People keep forgetting this. Your normal working class person probably isn't white. The proletariat of the United States is largely black and brown or, um, or Asian. It's not white people. White people make up a substantial portion of the bourgeoisie 
and the petty bourgeoisie, though. A guy set himself on fire yesterday. I'm not going to show the video, but because he was getting evicted. Horrible, horrible. But, again, we need a revolution. The cops were even fucking stunned. Co-opted the revolutionary history of MLK by Khadija Hines. I often think about how one of the most revolutionary black men in history can be completely altered. Completely reconstructed. going Undergoing a kind of magical, jolly, negro transmorgification. The legacy of King has been completely reconstructed to fit the pernicious fantasies of liberals, whose only aim is to use King's image as a tool to ensure black people remain servants of their own oppression, to insidiously use King's image in order to deploy the stifling hegemonic ideas of the ruling class. But the vile disfigurement of King's legacy as well, and his and the civil rights movement's undeniable Marxist foundations will no longer be erased. Huh, that's interesting. I wouldn't say that MLK had a communistic ideological basis this author claims here uh he actually read marx he said that he he agreed with the idea he agreed with the ideas of democratic socialism he did not a, he was not a marxist leninist he actually thought that um he referred to the system that existed in the soviet union as uh strangulating totalitarianism of course this was when he was still at uh this is still when he was at boston college i think but he was not a communist. He was not a Marxist-Leninist. He would probably identify as a democratic socialist today. Um, and he was also firmly religious. And a lot of black people actually have run into like this. Um, I run into this, this, uh, this rock when engaging with communism. They, they love the ideas. Okay. Like we love the ideas. We love the idea that the working class is entitled to what it produces, but the atheism that a lot of the um, that a lot of MLs and to this day MLMs embrace it doesn't work like with working class black people because we are a deeply religious people. Well, I'm not, but the majority of working class black people are. We are a church going people. So, am I saying that we should give like ideological leeway? No. Uh, MLM is still an atheist ideology, but we should also realize in our organizing that most of the people that we're going to be organizing with are religious and we should not insult their religion. So yeah, MLK was definitely a democratic socialist. But yes, we must study, learn, and re-educate our people of the revolutionary history of King and put a permanent end to the liberal teddy bearification of Dr. King's legacy. In short, when we talk about H. Rap Brown, when we talk about Fred Hampton, when we talk about Malcolm X, when we talk about Harry Haywood, we are talking about Martin Luther King. I agree. 18. Single. Alpha male. Widely successful. Passionately pro-Trump. Pro do you find this attractive? <laughs> he looks like that fucking prohibition agent from Boardwalk Empire. Or one of these thwomp things from Mario. No, I do not find him attractive. Last night, Columbia suspended six students, including a Palestinian student and two Jewish students. These students were arbitrarily selected by Columbia University for an investigation into a Palestine Solidarity Month event. They were suspended and evicted without any due process, given 24 hours notice to leave their homes. These suspensions came two nights after a Palestinian student was visited at their home, by a private investigator hired by Columbia University. After not being led into the student's house, the private investigator rattled the doorknob multiple times as if trying to break in. The student was forced to stay inside, was unable to attend prayer, and uh, break their fast. The event being investigated was held in a special housing community for queer Columbia students. In the next few hours, all except one of the student residents of the housing community were arbitrarily selected by Columbia's investigation team and threatened with immediate disciplinary action if they did not comply. The investigators demanded to see the private text messages of students in order to comply with the investigation. So let me get this straight. These kids are paying to go here. Okay? Like these kids are admitted to the university. They're paying to go here. And they're being treated like they're in fucking prison. Like, has there been an investigation of the IDF soldiers who literally sprayed skunk spray on Columbia students not even two months ago? Like, where's why aren't their pictures being falsed everywhere? Like, why are they... 
you try to break into this kid's house and then you demand to see their private text messages. And then when they don't comply with any of this illegal bullshit, you threaten to suspend them. That was fucking wild. These people are insane. Zionists are fucking insane. That's literally the only, the only take that I have on this. Insane. Like there's no, there's no nothing. There's no nothing. My friend has set up a GoFundMe for a Gaza family in order to evacuate, provide food, shelter, medical care, and allow for resettlement in a safer area. So they're at 670 of a $105,000 goal. Let's get those numbers up. Alice's, a riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo. <sighs> What's changed? than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. But in Rest in power. I need to go to sleep, otherwise I'm going to be resting in power. Did I see the video of those imposters pretending to be FBI agents and investigating a woman for her Facebook posts about Palestine? I did not. I do, I do other things besides sit around and watch Facebook videos and YouTube all fucking day. I read books. Like, I'm still working my way through the Song of Ice and Fire series. Again, I reread it once a year. I don't know why. It's just a weird ritual I do. But no, I have not seen that video. Uh, well, I may search it. Anyways. Peace.